Good morning, everyone. My name is Gail Day. I am the Executive Manager at the Free Market Foundation. In the last eight weeks, the FMF has launched eight booklets in the Laws Affecting Small Business series. These have proposed recommendations for red tape reduction in finance, health, justice, labor, land, licensing, schooling, and tax. As an important contribution to the literature on deregulation in contemporary South Africa, today we are launching Dr. Christoph Klein's research, The Case for Economic Deregulation and Decentralization. Christoph explores how deregulation and decentralization, particularly to the municipal level, interlink with one another. He points out that small and medium enterprises not only suffer um, from overregulation, but that they are hampered by corruption and mismanagement at municipal level. Christoph warns us not to be misled by the good intentions of economic regulations. More often than not, they yield detrimental consequences for the economy as a whole. Christoph is a managing partner at Dot Advisors, a consulting firm supporting clients to innovate, grow and improve their business. Thank you, Christoph. Thanks a lot, Gail. So I will start to share my screen and I hope actually that this is going to work immediately. So uh, is that visible? It's uh, there it is. It's on. All right, perfect. So it's also an impact assessment of government regulation. Um, and generally, this is a more uh, of a theoretical contribution on what SMEs are actually are and and how do they distinguish maybe from bigger enterprises and yes, uh, uh, um, how actually what can be done to make their life maybe a little bit easier or uh, for that matter is there actually anything you should do particularly for smes or does it apply to the entire economy when we talk about a deregulation and decentralization so if you look at the study that will be published uh, today on 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 free market foundation's homepage, um, it is structured uh, as follows there's First of all, as always, uh, an introduction where exactly that, that is being done. Then we talk a little bit about the regulation and institutional performance in South Africa specifically, and followed by, yeah, what are SMEs actually and, and, and how do you regulate uh, particularly for SMEs? We have a few case studies. We have then policy recommendations for deregulation and uh, yeah, I have a few concluding remarks on 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 actually in terms of the study. And um, I, I, what I found while I was doing my research is that uh, philosopher Lao Tzu, Chinese Taoist philosopher, what he said is actually to attain knowledge at things every day and to attain wisdom, remove things every day. So, so there's a little bit of 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 the let's say principles that underlies uh, underlines actually the research. So I will try to uh, limit actually my talking very much and more have an open discussion thereafter. So there are quite a few uh, uh, um, um, slides. So don't be bothered actually if I skip them through a little bit uh, uh, faster. Um, also, this presentation can be shared, obviously. So, number one. So, this study is concerned with small and medium enterprises and, and the question whether specific promotion of SMEs is actually supported by theoretical empirical evidence yeah, that they have suffered particularly over the last 10 to 15 years. So, when I ask this question, uh, th that means have they suffered more? as compared to let's say the bigger enterprises yeah 
And, and one of the most important points is actually that many large enterprises must also be understood actually as, as an agglomeration of uh, many SMEs under one roof. If you, if, if you uh, have a look at local, let's say, spa branches or retail shops of the large mobile carriers, yeah, they, they are under one legal umbrella, but they are still SMEs in terms of the specific entity. And if they don't uh, 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 perform, if they don't make a profit, they're going to be closed down. And and this is always on a on a municipal level. I just want to raise an important point because uh, uh, Mostly people think of, let's say, little workshops and retail shops with a few people, uh, uh, in even in informal sectors, and, and this is a somewhat romantic view. Actually, SMEs are very productive uh, uh, companies, and mostly they are not informal, they employ people, and the legal, let's say, the type of legal entity is actually not the most important point here. So what is the essential premise uh, of the study? First of all, people always work and consume at a particular place. That, that, that's actually very important. And, and this is mostly municipal. Yeah. So uh, what we're saying then is that the effects of uh, regulatory provisions and red tape, so of failing public services, for instance, and even corruption, they're always felt by flesh and people, uh, flesh and blood people on the ground. And this includes actually those uh, uh, subsidiaries of, let's say, the larger enterprises. They close sh uh, uh, their shops too if the economy is not performing or if the regulatory system actually is failing. So in... All this gets actually lost in the aggregate if, if we talk about GDP numbers and labor market statistics and so on and so forth. In the end, it doesn't matter actually whether people are being laid off. Unfortunately, it, it, it's, it's hardly in the, in the, in the uh, uh, headquarters of large enterprises. It's always on the ground. So, so what it says actually, uh, what this study says is like that the analysis of regulation and its effect must be devoted to understanding local governance structures and yeah, the degree of local autonomy actually to change things. And, and I'm going to proceed based on, on this premise. So prom promoting high economic growth of SMEs, and I put it in brackets, as well as larger enterprises, is actually to let people take matters into the their own hands. So what we've been seeing the last years with failing public services, particularly in the water and, and, and also in the energy sector, is that resident associations have been uh, established and they have sometimes taken over actually the operations, even funding uh, uh, material and labor uh, um, by their own resources. So these takeovers are actually first steps to liber uh, liberate actually South Africa's economic system. And this can only be happening on, on the, uh, at, from bottom up. This is actually quite important, particularly where we have infrastructure monopolies, where there's actually a prohibition to enter the market. So, so uh, what could be argued is that as long as such universal infrastructure services uh, 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 succeed, such mandates can be defended. But uh, probably South Africa is, is a very good example. We have been seeing that this doesn't quite work, particularly uh, if you look at, at energy and water. So if they don't work, they should be abolished. And, 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 and there's actually no parastatal in South Africa that, that really works. So if you look at Transnet or if you look at, at the, the water bodies or you look at postal, the postal sector, we're going to have a case study there, then uh, there is simply no competition uh, uh, in that market. And, and this makes it very difficult for the people to uh, receive uh, the services they, they deserve. Uh, on, on another side of the spectrum, you can see in the telecommunication sector what happened uh, uh, in the mobile space. So prepaid, uh, uh, which can be seen as, as, as a key to the success in, in the mobile space because people the first time in their life actually had access. 
uh, to uh, infrastructure services without credit vetting and without a bank account because they could prepay such services. And um, so uh, prepaid was actually introduced by uh, Vodacom in South Africa, uh, first time globally in 1998. And uh, there's many other, let's say, local uh, services that, that are attached to that, like mo mobile money and uh, fiber providers and, and, and many, let's say, uh, business models that are closely attached to the whole mo mobile ecosystem. So second example is, uh, as we speak right now, people are going off the energy grid due to uh, yeah, rapidly falling prices for solar energy. So this is also a very good example where slowly but surely uh, uh, people uh, uh, or enterprises can substitute, certainly in the, in, in, in the generation area, uh, uh, ESCOM services. So obviously uh, uh, regulation or deregulation for that matter has to pave the way to be able to do that. And, and mostly this happens unfortunately only uh, if there is massive failure of public services. So this was a little bit of an overview of, uh, let's say, particular examples to set the scene. And we're now going to uh, discuss uh, about regulation and institutional performance, particularly in South Africa. And yeah, when when we, we, we look at it, what, what is what is, let's say, the uh, uh, the target of a bill that would promote economic activities? as proposed by the Free Market Foundation. And this is obviously to unleash entrepreneurial activities that will boost economic growth and job creation. So, so uh, as opposed to that, the role of the state is, is you, you could say, is to protect, protect people actually from Adam Smith's invisible hand. So mostly what it says is that obviously there's always greed and, and, and reckless profit profiteering and people also need protections uh, uh, and against externalities and uh, yeah uh, uh, and 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 as long as, as as this works actually there is a case for uh, uh, public regulation to uh, protect citizens but uh, um, mostly or very often uh, in, in, in the course of time, there is an overreach and obviously there's public mandates and people are voted and there's last budget, large budgets. And uh, so regulatory systems or generally law uh, tends to mushroom into every corner of the economy and uh, to turn that back is, is, is quite difficult. So, but we must see that the uncertainty that uh, accompanies actually uh, the pursuit of profit also generates the ideas and opportunities that lead to productivity increases. So the, the best example again is mobile prepaid, but there are other very good examples in the South African economy. So what is government regulation? Uh, it may be understood that the attempt to create the institutional framework within which economic activity and entrepreneurship can flourish. Yeah, And th this obviously means protection, security, uh, 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 formal uh, legal legalization and law. So in terms of regulation, uh, there is you can divide that up into two types. There's first of all, the regulatory frameworks that kind of apply to the entire economy. And these are the uh, uh, those that I just mentioned, like law and occupational safety and health and uh, environmental law and also licensing. So in, 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 in uh, this sense or in that type of uh, regulation, the state acts as a rule maker and institution builder but the concrete economic outcome like market shares, prices, profits, production structure actually is left to market uh, competition, which means that consumer choice and entrepreneurial innovation and competition uh, actually determine uh, market outcomes. Um, the second one is actually the, the regulation of specific sectors. So this mostly happens in the health and education space 
and in all network infrastructure. So these are the big infrastructures, road, railway, water, energy, and telecommunication. With the exception of the latter, mostly all of these services in South Africa are still in public hands or uh, to a very large degree in public hands. And for a very good reason, uh, the telecommunication sector in South Africa is the most successful infrastructure offering in the market. People might complain about certain aspects, but in the end, it, it's the only service uh, uh, on the whole continent of Africa where everybody uh, has access to, let's say, an affordable service. This uh, We are far away from making that happen in the water area, in the railway area, or let alone in the energy area. So what is the problem here? Here, the state turns from a rule maker to a producer of services, mostly through state-owned enterprises, and at the same time, the public monopolization of the market. And, and, and here comes the big problem, because if you have public property, uh, property there is no uh, competition. So the price uh, mechanism doesn't work and markets are not contestable and actually the managers or the politicians or whatever you call it, they are not accountable. They are, have no skin in the game. They are not invested. And this is a big problem. And, and in most countries, uh, um, uh, affordable infrastructure services are the backbone for any type of businesses. So, so to give an example, when I was traveling through the, the Western Cape, Many little cheese producers have been closing down simply because they cannot afford the energy bill. So uh, this is just one example where where you can see uh, uh, that regulation is, is not a particularly nitty gritty thing uh, uh, in terms of one law or one specific regulation is actually also about the, the, the very big infrastructure providers where we need uh, um, competition. So there is one uh, uh, famous book, and this is Why Nations Fail from Asimoglu and Huntington, and uh, they talk about extractive economic institutions uh, that impede uh, or even block economic growth. And the last, let's say, certainly the last 12 years in South Africa, we have been seeing pretty much of this. So SA institutions certainly did not perform well and mostly this is felt on a municipal level where people actually uh, uh, yeah just on an everyday basis need need to survive and need to let let's say uh, 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 work and uh, so if, if if you don't have uh, uh, let's say reliable energy access or water access this actually reverberates through the entire local economy and we, not have, we don't have to speak about education and security. So just looking at a few statistics, there is, for instance, the fundamental rights uh, law index. And uh, so in terms of the constitution, South Africa is a, a very modern uh, institution, it's one of the best in the world, at, at, at least uh, uh, if, from, from, if you look at it, uh, uh, without uh, seeing what's happening on the ground. So here it looks quite good. Uh, South Africa's ranked on 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 45th. It, 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 it's still, let's say, a very, let's say, well-managed country in terms of the formal legal system, if you want to say so, yeah. Um, but uh, if you look at specific business indicators, like the influential ease of doing business by the World Bank, one South Africa stood actually at, at uh, 32nd and, and they dropped uh, uh, to the 84th rank by 2020. I think that was the latest one that was published. And I cannot imagine that uh, by now, uh, end of 2022, they will have made it actually uh, again a few notches up. Uh, it's quite unlikely. And where uh, uh, South Africa is particularly bad is in terms of governance efficiency. There, it, it, it actually ranks even after, uh, after Zimbabwe uh, and compared to its peers like, like of the BRIC states, like China, Russia, and Brazil, uh, uh, they are simply at the bottom of the table. And again, uh, 
the efficiency in terms of executing law on 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 is, is mostly felt on a gov on on a municipal level, and uh, so this this is the biggest problem for everyday life of an entrepreneur or of people that living in 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 particularly uh, remote little uh, uh, towns and villages. Yeah, but you can also see that obviously in the bigger towns, you just have to go to a home affairs branch. Uh, and 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 you know what it means actually uh, uh, when when a public institution doesn't do its job. So let's look a little bit at at theory. Um, so as Gail has uh, uh, introduced uh, uh, today's session, uh, she was saying that I'm arguing pretty much from the perspective of. Uh, achieving uh, a subnational tax autonomy. So it means actually that the, the um, decision making about uh, uh, the important services of everyday life should be as much as possible uh, on, on the local government level or on the local citizen levels. And um, um, what it means is actually uh, tax revenue should actually be uh, levied ideally on a subnational level uh, and and there are a few like property taxes and transfer tax but uh, there's for instance no local personal income tax and uh, this is obviously the most juicy ones and also VAT is being collect collected on a, a, a national level mostly Instead, uh, in particularly in South Africa, most of the public funds are being channeled from the central government actually through grants and transfers to the local level. And this is a big problem because it, 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 it makes the local uh, uh, governance and government levels actually dependent on central government. And, and, and this is what we see in South Africa every day. So if we look at at let's say uh, financial autonomy um, or let's call it rather the, the degree to take your own decisions on a local level then we first can see what share of revenue is actually being collected uh, by the central government and there we see actually that south uh, uh, africa is not doing too badly particularly if you compare to other uh, african countries but if you now uh, uh, look at the tax revenue raised on 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 the local level, there you see it's only five percent, and of the rest of the ninety five that's being uh, uh, um, that that basically you can see as a budget as a, 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 a municipal budget, seventy percent is actually being financed by subsidies and grants. And that creates enormous dependency. And uh, that's, uh, according to my view, the single biggest problem in, in South Africa and of many other uh, African countries. Yeah, and this is again highlighting it, uh, the big spread between, uh, let's say, local taxes and uh, the grant portion. So in essence, if we assume a world uh, um, where you would raise 100% of your taxes locally, which is quite unrealistic, I know, but at least uh, that would mean that you can go to your mayor or uh, to uh, the local administration and actually ask them what they do with your money. Yeah, if you live in the Popo, uh, you just cannot do it because uh, uh, um, the resources are being allocated by quite complex uh, uh, schemes and and there's essentially no accountability on a wider economic level. So there's no uh, um, a connection between uh, the taxes you pay on a local level, uh, you know, that that's where your productive efforts take place and uh, uh, the income that uh, the state realizes based on 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 that productivity. And it's basically a disconnect, and it's it's it, it's a huge problem. I have a little comment here: the history of industrial development in Europe. Back in the 18th and 19th century, there were actually no central government taxes. 
most people have forgotten that now because everybody is so used to, let's say, the government having the major share of the tax bill. Effectively, the princes and kings, they had to beg if they wanted to, to launch a war in the 18th century and 17th century because all taxes were collected on a municipal level. There was no other way. Yeah, And uh, also because of the banking system at that point in time. So I have to have a quick look on the, yeah, I think I have like 10 minutes more roughly. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. So there's a little uh, here is a definition. Uh, um, according to the OECD, uh, an SME is an, a non-subsidiary independent firm which employ fewer than a given number of employees, most frequently fewer than 250 employees. So this is actually a quite big company. I think this is not mirroring very well uh, the reality on the ground in, in uh, uh, let's say, at least in on the African continent. Yeah, but still, uh, uh, these uh, uh, make up 99% uh, um, of all enterprise in the European Union, for instance. Yeah. And um, so uh, then SMEs are estimated to account for 6 to 70 percent of all employment across uh, OECD countries. So they have a very significant share. And uh, the key point I want to make here is actually that uh, um, a spa outlet or an APSA branch or a Caltex gas station, in, in the, the, they also have to be considered as as a kind of as SME, though they are protected by a, a corporate roof and mostly uh, uh, will not go down as quickly as others. Uh, uh, if the economy knows dives, actually, these remote uh, outlets and branches are the first to be hit. And so so one of the main points in the study is uh, to, to not uh, uh, artificially distinguish between, let's say, informal or a small independent business and, let's say, such branch branches. Uh, if there's too much red tape and regulation, the whole economy suffers. It doesn't matter, actually, whether there's a corporate roof uh, 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 on top of them or not. So, um, yeah, this is a definition that it's basically legalistic kind of definition of, of, of what an SME is and what not. So where people work locally, it's mostly an SME. So now let's look at the Small Business Institute in South Africa. 98% uh, of all employing fee, uh, firms employed fewer than 250 people. Yeah, and 66% are micro businesses with 10 or fewer. So this is much more the reality on South Africa uh, on the ground. And for a good reason, they call it the engine room of South Africa's economy, because uh, I mean, this is where the people work. Yeah, this is where the people uh, earn their income uh, in, in, yeah, two thirds of the cases. Yeah, and then the, the big question is whether uh, the idea or the perception is realistic that that SMEs are treated uh, as an economic widget by government or big business. Uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure whether this is, 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 is the right angle, but uh, what's certainly correct is that regulatory actions are very often oriented towards big business. And this ha obviously happens for a very good reason, because the opportunity to, to benefit from rent seeking measures is far more, far higher actually than if you try to squeeze that out actually from the smaller companies. Yeah. And the second point is then obviously that those businesses, so even where that retail branch in, 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 in Ladyland or wherever is, uh, uh, um, they obviously have more resources to fight against certain uh, regulatory uh, uh, let's say laws that harm their business or red tape and SMEs normally don't have these resources. So in that, that uh, respect, actually larger corporations or uh, um, let's say such structures are obviously better off uh, to protect themselves. So this is what it says is that large businesses have balance sheet and they can withstand economic downturns also for a longer time. So do do SMEs actually suffer more from red tape and bureaucracy as compared to uh, larger enterprises? 
Probably yes. Uh, are they particularly vulnerable? Yeah, to a degree, they might be more vulnerable. Uh, um, and so what does it mean in the greater scheme of things? So uh, regulation always uh, imposes costs on the economy. And the idea obviously is that the benefits of such regulation outweigh the costs of, of administering it. And if we talk about red tape, then the opposite is the case. Yeah, it doesn't regulation doesn't fulfill its purpose and the costs outweigh the benefits. So the answer to the question here is is, is not clear cut uh, uh, in the greater scheme of, of, of things because it doesn't matter if you look at smaller enterprises or again the bigger enterprises, which is a legalistic idea. Economic damage caused by red tape uh, reverberates actually to the anti-economic or the wider economic system and everybody uh, uh, um, suffers. So this is why uh, my focus is always on the infrastructure providers, and these are mostly SOEs, so parastatals, without competition, uh, with a certain degree of graft and inefficiency and bad governance systems. And uh, so, uh, and, 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 and these, uh, let's say, failures particularly happen on a local level, because the power of the people, uh, uh, um, let's say in remote cities is actually very limited. So in, 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 in Joburg or maybe in Pretoria, if uh, um, there is a certain degree of service uh, uh, that in many uh, uh, um, other, let's say, parts of the country is not being upheld. Um, so is deregulation the way to go? Uh, um, well, um, I'm not going to go through all of these points, but deregulation itself is, is, is actually uh, regulation. Yeah. So, so mostly we have to be very careful because after deregulation, you have more complex regulation uh, than uh, before. Uh, 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 than before. And uh, I just uh, would ask you to go into the study and see what actually. Uh, Deregulatory action could mean, uh, and I've uh, established here the example of a liquor license, and it's extremely complex. And uh, instead of actually fine tuning uh, regulation by or deregulation, it's very uh, often the better way to repeal certain laws altogether. So let's have a look at, at, at a few case studies. Uh, first of all, and I'm not going to go into the detail, I again refer to the case study. Most people don't know, but the electrification of China actually was bottom up, mostly local water schemes. And even to this day, more than 50% of the uh, um, generation uh, um, um, production structure is being owned by, by people and municipalities in China. So you think there is an all-powerful communist party, that's actually a myth. And, and without that kind of electrification in China and, and towards the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s, we, China wouldn't be where we have it right now. South Africa went the other way, complete centralization through ESCOM, and it, it actually has been, uh, uh, um, uh, how would you say, it has been worsening from year to year. And uh, yeah, um, we all live in this country and we know what it means. Another great example is the South African Post Office. So uh, as per law, they have the right to provide delivery services for all letters, postcards, and so on uh, uh, below one kilogram. And they have been failing, as we all know, and uh, a very big uh, industry has been emerging that deliver all of these uh, smaller packages. And uh, now there is actually a, a law battle between ICASA and, and, and Postnet, who is actually one of the successful local private uh, uh, providers um, that actually simply wants to execute uh, the existing law. And that would basically mean that the, 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 the entire postal sector would go down. So uh, this is, let's say, has been uh, mid-2021. I don't know where this legal battle stands right now. I, I, I must check. Uh, so far, actually, Postnet is still operating. And I, I, I guess if, if uh, 
um, um, Sapo will will get his right back according to the regulation. Probably uh, those providers will invent something that that will shift actually each of the packets above uh, uh, the one kilogram uh, threshold. Yeah. So what ICASA spokesperson Maleka in a letter to the editor of Business Day said, ICASA's mandate is to implement what the law requires. We are doing exactly that. So this is a very good uh, uh, example of, of, let's say, meaningless and, and, and actually absurd uh, uh, understanding of law and regulation. Another very good example is Burger King. So, so uh, Competition Commission has prohibited the acquisition of shares, uh, so I think 68% from a PE fund. We must understand that these 68 have been owned by a fund of disadvantaged persons, and they would have reduced it from 68 to 0%. So these disadvantaged persons would have cashed in what in, in, in the end is, is, is the goal of every business. And what the commission said is actually that it is concerned that the proposed merger will have a substantial negative effect on the promotion of greater spread of ownership in particularly to increase the level of ownership by HDR, so uh, HDP. So, so, so this again, is, it, it, it's absurd because they prohibit this transaction because it achieved what it was meant to achieve, namely that, that uh, these persons actually sell their shares uh, and, and maybe invest that into university education of the people. So, but if you just look at statistics, obviously, uh, yeah, the Competition Commission is correct. Suddenly there are zero percent of HDP share, and uh, this looks bad on 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 in terms of the statistics. But uh, as said, it's absurd, yeah. And then there is a case of the uh, a specific municipality. I would uh, uh, recommend to just Google it up and it, 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 it's one of the more uh, abstruse actually examples in South Africa. So what are policy recommendations uh, for deregulation? And I think I must speed up. Uh, uh, it's 1041. Uh, I want to not go longer than 1045. So uh, there is essentially four principles of what I call citizen oriented and, and market based regulation. And, and, and the first principle is that the domain of all registration and license procedures should st strictly sit with local mu municipal councils. The, when you establish that, you have a far greater accountability as if you have central bodies, uh, regulatory bodies that sit somewhere in Pretoria or in Johannesburg or in Cape Town. So it, it ties people actually to, to uh, uh, let's say, flesh and blood political or, or administrative people in the local councils. And that's quite important that you can go somewhere. That, that is an inherent or implicit uh, accountability mechanism and uh, all centralized regulation uh, violates it. So the next uh, principle is that all trade licenses should be repealed. And I'm talking about those trade licenses that are along geographical or industry specific levels. So, so uh, in the mobile space, for instance, you have these uh, national mobile licenses it's actually very harmful to the mar market because in, in, in many areas of the country, you don't have 4G uh, or, or proper broadband services. And because these frequency licenses are national, nobody's allowed to enter, uh, irrespective of a certain degree of service that, that exists in certain areas of the country. So this is one example. A third one is that public certificates and the practical execution of certification should uh, uh, be allowed to be uh, uh, carried out by competing private players. And the fourth one, I don't want to go into the detail, is uh, that you must be able to get those documents from alternative providers. That can be regulated, but uh, uh, you must not be forced or should not be forced to simply go to that one organization which is called for instance national home affairs and where you stand actually from eight o'clock in the morning to five and just when you are about to enter actually they close down the office 
because uh, business hours uh, uh, um, um, are only until five o'clock. So there's good examples in South Africa where you actually have liberal markets and where deregulation has succeeded. So South African's agricultural sector is world class. It's one of the best in the world. Uh, Uber uh, was a boon to South Africa beforehand. We all know that we it, it was rather, let's say, unpleasant to jump off one of these old Mercs. Uh, uh, mobile telecommunication, I've talked about it, and over, not, not so much in South Africa, but mobile money schemes uh, um, like M-Pesa in, 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 in Kenya, they actually have made up for absent retail banking in, in, in those countries. So what can be done? And then I'm basically through. Uh, very good. Uh, what I like a lot is uh, local service delivery protests and if possible tax withholding because uh, this, this, this is actually when, you, when, when power is threatened most. Um, so takeovers of certain uh, uh, infrastructures. So that, that is increasingly happening. Uh, the press doesn't like to, to talk about it, and at least not where it's ANC controlled, but it's a very powerful mechanism when after prolonged uh, periods of time, people actually take over the water plant or, or actually uh, 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 um, certain parts of the energy grid. Yeah, uh, Cut out of failing and needless intermediaries and yeah, re-establish municipalities as entities accountable to their citizens. Uh, this is a more general ask actually, uh, and, and, and this will take a long time. Finally, there is an idea of special economic zones, industrial development zones. So in the Western Cape, this has succeeded. I'm rather skeptical because to create a special economic zone means regulation. Um, so you regulate a special economic zone where you deregulate things that you don't want to deregulate in other parts of the economy. So I'm a bit skeptical and in, 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 in many, let's say, parts of the world, uh, this hasn't worked. There's shining examples like like uh, uh, whatever Hong Kong uh, and and also Shanghai, which has a status of of a particular economic zone, but these cannot be easily replicated. So the way forward, uh, I, I I don't want to bore you with a lengthy conclusion. So so. Um, I'm, I'm going to refer to uh, uh, the study uh, to look at this point and would like to hand over uh, uh, the forum back to Gail and invite questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, your attention and hopefully we have a little discussion. Thank you so much, Christoph. We well, really appreciate the time that you've spent with us. Perhaps you can switch off your screen and we can just see your face and then I can see if anybody would like to ask some questions. Um, just before I move on to anybody who might have their hand up, if, if you want to speak, please just pop your hand up and unmute yourself or you can type in. Uh, Christoph, maybe you can leave your face, but not your slides. That'll be great. Uh, OK, um, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, have to... um, I just wanted to make a, a comment perhaps before we move on to anybody else. I think it's interesting the point you made, and it's an obvious point, that the entire economy really suffers under excess regulation. So it's not only small business, there's an impact on the entire economy. And I must say, when we were looking at revisiting our uh, Laws Affecting Small Business series, it was clear to us that our first choice would be simply a removal of bad law, a deregulation um, for everybody. Um, and our second choice would be an exemption of small for small business um, from bad law. But um, I, I do think it's important to note that the entire economy suffers. And to some extent, this taps into your um, special economic zone comment. I've never understood why, if you understand that a lower tax uh, delivers growth, why don't you just introduce a lower tax, you know, countrywide? Why does it have to be in, in a particular zone? Anyway, that's uh, me holding the floor for a moment. Um, perhaps we can see if anybody else would like to ask a question. Um, I see Zakes has his hand up. Zakes, if you'll just unmute yourself. Welcome. Uh, greetings, greetings. Uh, Christoph, you mentioned a 
I think the the, the competition, uh, the, or the, at the very least, having public entities have competition in what are considered usually public services like water, energy, and, and and things like that. And the biggest opposition, at the very least, that you know a proponent of an idea like that faces is the the public benefit argument of services like that, whereby you have you know the argument that should water be fully privatized, then allowances like you know currently with most water boards in South Africa that give a certain amount of liters freely to people and the same thing with electricity with electricity too. So what would be your response to a critique like that? Yeah. So um, it, it from from the face of it in pure theoretical terms, there's no way even as a hardcore libertarian to prove that a public enterprise will fail. So it's simply there is no let's say way of, of of doing that. It it's it it it's more a matter of logic, yeah. That that uh, uh, you, you you know the benefit of doubt that people take their destiny into their own hands and are more productive than people with uh, if they inject their own equity, as opposed to people that simply work on public funds. This is a logical matter, and and there are very good empirical ways uh, or empirical examples to show uh, what happens if you uh, um, let's say anti uh, 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 um, let's say a public sector. Let's think of the public telecommunication or fixed line telecommunication. It has been said that you cannot privatize. Uh, fixed line telecommunication because it's a natural monopoly. So the result was that in, in the on the entire uh, continent of South Africa, you had a penetration level, uh, excluding South Africa, by the way, 0.1% uh, uh, of the population. So essentially, a very few businesses and the public sector, they had fixed line. And there's not not one actually fixed line operator that ever made a profit actually in 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 the public space. So that's because there were no expectations when mobile was introduced. Everybody was thinking, well, the postpaid scheme, hundred U.S. dollar a month uh, uh, with credit vetting and a bank account and a very good job and salary slip. They gave the license away for nothing because nobody had the expectation that it could ever succeed. And then Vodacom came with prepaid and literally overnight you expanded the addressable market from, let's say, a few hundred thousand of rich people that would go for a hundred euro postpaid to like billions of people worldwide. So. The thing is, you, if you deregulate, if you if you uh, release a market to uh, uh, or a sector to competition, you cannot foresee what's going to happen. But if you strangle it, it it won't happen. And 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 this is uh, probably uh, if you don't let's say uh, talk about empirical examples. Uh, um, then you will have a hard time actually to argue with a proponent of public monopolies because he will always say actually that there is a public interest and we must make sure that everybody gets affordable services and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, uh, South Africa is a very good example that it doesn't work. We, we, we see in which states uh, 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 the, the parastatals are. Uh, uh, ESCOM is the single largest debtor uh, on the whole continent and makes up a huge chunk of, of, of government debt and government debt is going to even take over now uh, uh, whatever 20, 30 percent of ESCOM's debt. So this is a very long answer to your to your question. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. It's a, it's a good on. Thank you, Christoph. Are there perhaps any other questions? Um, you're obviously free to ask them. Just perhaps pop your hand up and unmute yourself, or otherwise you can type something into the chat. Christoph, I just wanted to ask you, um, if I may, the idea of uh, local government perhaps 
contracting out to small businesses, you know, so if they have to keep the parks clean, um, perhaps they could contract that out to the private sector um, and stimulate uh, small business in that way. Is that feasible? It It is feasible, and I, I, I think they are doing that uh the, the point is if there is no budget accountability it will not work we all know uh, who's going to contract whom yeah uh and 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 this this opens the door actually to corruption yeah so so as long as as a public uh uh let's say uh um um yeah public officials employed by the state and there is no budget autonomy in, in, in these municipalities, then the funds will come from the central government. This is what I just meant with the grants mm -hmm. and the subsidies. And yes, it, 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 it mostly those uh, minor services are being outsourced already because uh, uh, the state also can cannot afford many things and they don't don't have their own gardening company and they don't ha uh, own their cleaning companies. But still, uh, without autonomy, financial autonomy and clear accountability, it, it won't work. I think for many people, there'll be a fear that local governments um, able to collect their own taxes um, might in fact be less autonomous or, or, or less accountable, perhaps. Um, I think there's quite a lot of fear around corruption and mismanagement and so on. Um, I'm I'm assuming you have a, a, a sort of an answer to how that would be managed and how accountability works when it's closer to the people. Yeah, if 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 governments cannot be uh, local governments or municipalities cannot be bailed out uh, by let's say a federal government, so 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 in Joburg or even by uh, uh, provinces, uh, then actually there's nobody where they can hide behind. Yeah. So so uh, this is the essential argument is that. Uh, um, it, it might not work in the first or second year, but if, if I know that only the mayor and the people are responsible for certain services and that on 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 the uh, let's say kind of, uh, uh, you know, these people are voted on a local level, too. So I, I would vote them. They are not being seconded by ANC, uh, let's say, national level. Uh, so, so it's basically I I, I uh, uh, nominate those people, and this is obviously uh, a, a very important prerequisite to to make it work. You can only have accountability if you can dismiss these people, also. Yeah. Thank you, Christoph. Are there any other questions? <laughs> I see Zex is cheering. Yeah. Thank you, Zex. <laughs> Um, it seems that we don't have any other questions. So I'd just like to say thank you again to you, Krista, for um, not only giving your time today, but for drafting this really important addition to the discussion around deregulation. And we will certainly be sharing that very widely um, in the future. And then thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, really appreciate you being here. Thanks a lot, Gail. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.